I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I am your host Shri Krishna Upadhyay. We are doing a two-part series on digitalization of healthcare in India on All Things Policy. Today's first episode is going to be about the transformative potential of digitalization of healthcare, and we will be focusing on the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission or the ABDM launched by the Union Government in September 2021. We will look at the, the different digital health initiatives that have been launched under the ABDM. mission and see how these can lead to a more accessible efficient and equitable healthcare system in the country in a later episode we'll discuss something called the unified healthcare interface or uhi which is also being built as part of the abdm and is going to be the digital public infrastructure for healthcare in india so joining me today on all things policy are two guests so first off let me introduce to you surbi arun associate director of international innovation core a university of chicago social impact fellowship that operates in india and the us welcome to all things policy survey thank you shri thank you so much and i also have with me riya singh who is part of the iic as well and is currently the project lead of ayushman bharat digital mission at the national health authority welcome riya happy to have you here thank you very excited to be here great so you know before we discuss abdm i thought we can just Start about the healthcare problem in the country, right? And when I look at the issue broadly, after zooming out, uh, you know, I identify certain problems which are poor public health expenditure in the country, uh, shortage of doctors and medical staff, uh, burgeoning population that needs quality healthcare, increasing health costs, and also low insurance coverage, right? Uh, so in this picture that I've painted, uh, where does digital uh, or digitalization of healthcare come in, and how is it going to be solving India's healthcare problems? Thank you for that, Shri. Um, I think we have to understand that digital per se is not new to the healthcare space. Uh, there was a lot of digital innovation in the healthcare for the longest time. What we're talking about is a digital ecosystem, um, which has been the trend across all these sectors. Healthcare is, of course, much later in its journey for adopting an overall ecosystem that enables transaction. now uh, we obviously understand that there are challenges the way you are sh- sharing but digital can't necessarily solve for it what it's meant to do is enable unlocking some of these challenges so by digital we can't really increase professional resources suddenly right but what you can do is you can leverage the capacity of the existing forces to give some more access to uh, healthcare fe- services and that's what we're trying to do uh while there is a longer journey towards providing universal health coverage and improving the quality of our services digital cure is just a means in um in the journey for us right so so be what you're saying essentially is tech much like in every other sector is going to be an accelerator when it comes to uh, healthcare as well in the country right uh, but typically you know at least in my mind when you speak of uh, digital healthcare my mind immediately jumps to teleconsultations right uh, and that's because uh, we often say that okay you have shortage of uh, doctors in rural areas people who uh, uh, or doctors don't like going there to offer their services and so on uh, but thanks to you know 4G 5G technology or mobile apps and so on we can actually uh bridge that gap right while doctors sit in urban areas and give consultations to people spread across the country so when you talk about digitalization as a concept is it just about that is it just about you know bridging this uh, urban rural gap or you know making sure healthcare uh, services are available at the grassroots or is it something more comprehensive is it about like you know it is also equally applicable to you and me for instance uh, so is that how it is conceptualized the digital ecosystem is inclusive for everyone uh because what it's meant to do is just like you and i in the urban spaces and people in rural spaces require quality services uh require better access to healthcare and healthcare facilities so digital in that sense is comprehensive and not and like you rightly said there are some aspects of teleconsultation that we immediately think about 
but this imagination for digital health is much broader much more holistic which should mean that um the person moving from rural space to urban spaces as well should have access to the information of their historical treatments right and it is it is not only meant for the geography you are uh, restricted to this is also focusing uh, on the larger uh, mandate the government has to ensure that everyone is given access to healthcare everyone is given quality healthcare and that you're also meeting your sdg targets right so uh, thanks for this background picture uh, and i would like to move to you know ayushman bharat's digital mission and try to unpack what that holds so for digitalization as such uh, the first of course what i think most people would be familiar with is ayushman bharat health cards uh, which is essentially a five lakh insurance coverage which the union government is providing to certain sections of the population uh, but i believe the Ayushman Bharat's digital mission is a, a much larger policy uh, push by the government. Of course, it was launched somewhere in September two thousand twenty-one. Ah, uh, but uh, you know, even before we come to what it entails and what are the elements of ABDM and so on, maybe Ria, could you tell us, you know, what is the thinking behind it? Ah, uh, because I remember reading and hearing about national health stack. Ah, uh, during the days when everyone was caught up with Aadhaar and India stack and so on, this was you know even before the pandemic hit us. Uh, so what was the policy thinking up till two thousand twenty-one that actually resulted in the ABDM? So if you could shed shed some light on that. No, yeah, thanks for calling out PMJ. Uh, I think that's been a scheme that's been around a lot longer and is widely known. And uh, actually, a lot of folks end up con- you know kind of confusing the two schemes and thinking ABDM is part of that scheme itself. So I just also want to um, specifically call out for the audience that uh, the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission is actually a separate scheme. the pmj scheme abdm and some and two other schemes actually sit under the larger ayushman bharat umbrella um of various schemes that are focused in you know kind of improving healthcare and towards uh the universal health coverage uh, objective uh, but abdm is actually a separate scheme that is more focused on um, building the infrastructure for digitizing healthcare in the country so just to give a context of where uh abdm uh, kind of aishman bharat digital mission came into the picture and just to kind of con- cr- chronicle the journey so far um it's actually been a few years in the making so while it was launched in 2021 there's a lot of background work that happened um and over the years you know it's been a very consultative collaborative process with many different ecosystem uh, stakeholders who who weighed in uh, contributed at different stages of this policy form- formulation at the beginning um this included industry experts healthcare and tech experts market players to be able to comprehensively define a road map ahead um so it actually some of the thinking started um you know in 2016 and in about 2017 we actually had the first document that came out uh, which was a national health policy um by by the ministry of health and family welfare which extensively advocated uh, for deployment of digital tools for improving the efficiency and outcome of the healthcare ecosystem and this was very much in line with india's commitment to the sdg 3 specifically you know which focuses on uh, health and well being um post which in 2018 niti aayog actually came up with the national health stack which set out the vision for a digital stack for health and outlined the key objectives and the principles that this stack could uh, you know achieve eventually in 2019 we had a very comprehensive document that came out which is a national digital health blueprint which again was aligned with the national health policy of 2017 and the health stack vision document as well which put down the framework of actually building this digital mission to so to speak of um where the architectural vision the implementation guidance uh the framework along with the infrastructure the building blocks and the regulations um that would be required to execute a mission of such scale Uh, and and eventually in 2020 we also had more documents that came out from niti aayog and the ministry and national health authority as well who uh, contributed very closely in a lot of these documents all of this led to eventually the national digital health mission being uh, you know uh, launched in a pilot phase um, in the year of 2020 uh, in six uts in the country and then and then as we know it in 2021 it, it was eventually launched nationwide so just to kind of summarize you know we there's been a lot of work that's happened and a lot of uh, research documentation a lot of thinking that's gone behind um to abdm as it stands today in its design and implementation 
Right. And I just wanted to know what was the impact of the pandemic in this entire process, right? Uh, because uh, as we know, especially during the second wave, uh, which was summer of 2021, the Indian healthcare system sort of uh, stood exposed or rather the shortcomings were out in the fore for everybody to witness. Uh, and that was a pressing time. And then a few months later, we had the ABDM, right? Uh, so was this a journey somehow like yours or did the pandemic rather jumpstart or uh, not jumpstart rather but gave a heavy push uh, for it to be you know pushed out uh, or did it in any way affect or sort of like change the thinking behind how we should help uh, approach digital healthcare in the country right actually pandemic did accelerate some of the work uh, that was already happening uh, but i think what it did more so was it kind of reinstated the belief in the framework that was already put down earlier so, and I'll give you an example, right? Um, one of the things everyone struggled with was finding the right drug at the right time. Is there a critical care unit available? Where are beds available, right? These were things that everyone was kind of frantically looking for over WhatsApp groups, informally in your networks, in your circles. But there was no one solu- one answer that you, there was one, one platform where you could get that answer. And as you kind of tie that back to ABDM, there are actually building blocks that facilitate for just such use cases. Right, And we'll probably talk about this in the future, but solving for such problems of discovery of beds, discovery of doctors uh, in good time with fair price discoverability, uh, being able to avail services from verified healthcare professionals and verified health facilities. Right, These are all things that are actually addressed by the ABDM framework. So if anything, it actually kind of pushed it and not saying we're going in the right direction. Right. So it's sort of like... uh validated the government's thinking till uh, up till that point you know uh, so yeah. let's just talk about uh, the building blocks like you put it right uh, so uh, simple question what are these building blocks of abdm uh, you said it's not only about teleconsultation you said it's not only about insurance but there is a lot more going on so what is it uh, what are these building blocks uh, and uh, how would you place them within the larger objectives of the mission so to take a step back of what abdm is and what the objective is so abdm essentially is um built with the objective to uh, is designed with the objective to build uh, the digital infrastructure required to build an open digital health ecosystem and there are different components as part of this entire stack and what it addresses to to get into it there are four four broad buckets if i were to put it in that one is the identity layer itself so this is providing identity a uh, verifiable identity actually to different stakeholders in the ecosystem so this is an identity for every citizen who wants to access healthcare every healthcare provider who wants to provide healthcare every facility which is part which is part of the healthcare ecosystem and even an ad- identification for 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 drugs in the country and the idea is to become to provide a single source of truth uh, as uh, for all of these actors that I spoke of and these are essentially designed as central repositories that are uh, built and hosted by the National Health Authority um, to essentially build more trust uh, in the ecosystem itself of the various actors that participate in it. And all, a lot of these identities are actually built using some of the existing digital public goods that that are already present. So they're being uh, they're built using things like Aadhaar, Aadhaar um, e-sign, consent, artifact. A lot of these things are all, all, all already contributing to uh, this design. On top of that, there are three gateways that are also built and they enable interoperability of various aspects. So one particular gateway called the Health Information um, Exchange Consent Manager, that gateway is specifically built to drive uh, interoperability, drive exchange of health data across uh, various um, actors in the ecosystem. And the idea with this is to actually unlock the value of health of data that currently sits today in a very siloed format. So what that means is, uh, you know, typically if you go to a facility, go to a doctor to avail any healthcare, there's some data that's generated and typically that's stored in two ways, right? One is either it is stored at the facility itself in whatever software that they're using. And second is you may get a uh, a physical format of a physical copy of it that you go go back home keep it locked up which is probably collecting dust over time and then when you actually need it you're unable to look for it or um or you're not able to build on top of that in the long term right so you lose that somewhere in your journey so the idea is to actually how can different how can data sitting in different places actually then be tied back to a citizen through using their abha um, which is the Aishman Bharat Health Account that 
citizen identifier that I spoke of earlier um, and essentially contribute to building their longitudinal health history. So whatever you go, whatever your data is generated with your consent, it should be linked back to your linked back to your ABHA number, your ABHA. Um, and if you choose to share that, if you want to share that between two facilities, uh, you know, say in terms of if you're trying to get a second opinion, uh, you've just been prescribed a test and you want to share back your reports with the doctor. So between two any two facilities you want to um, enable exchange of that data with your consent, that can happen through this gateway. Um, the second gateway is about uh, the unified health interface. This is specifically about uh, enabling an interoperability in digital health services. It, it is an open network based on open specifications uh, to allow for use cases such as, you know, discovering doctors across platforms, booking any kind of consultation, booking an ambulance, uh, purchasing a drug across different platforms. So it's what essentially does enables is around different applications, both from a user standpoint, so that could be any, your, any of your personal health record applications um, or any application from a provider side. So to be able to speak to one another. Um, and the third is the NHCX, which is the National Health Claims Exchange. This specific gateway is uh, essentially to standardize the claims processing between any facility and a, and a payer. And the idea is that over t- over over time, right, when all of this kind of comes together, these dis- identity layer, these different uh, gateways that I spoke of, uh, they provide a more different market players come and integrate with them, and they leverage these digital public goods, and then they take that take that back to the users that are using these platforms, and essentially provide a more holistic and more comprehensive healthcare experience to the citizen. So, if you notice in these three gateways that I spoke of, it is right about discovering a service availing that service to the UHI gateway, then be uh, exchanging health data, managing your health data better through the HICM gateway. And then essentially when the payment bits comes in, when your insurance comes in through the NHCX gateway. So essentially it covers the entire uh, value chain for the for the user to speak of. And, and I also just want to end this, that this entire design is grounded in a lot of found very key uh, design and tech principles, right? both from a policy as well as an architectural standpoint. So one of that could be all of this is based on federated architecture. So barring the registries, everything is uh, all data that's generated. It's stored where it's genera- generated and cannot be exchanged without any consent of the user itself. This privacy by design, it's currently voluntary in nature. So a lot of this policy thinking and the has gone behind into the entire designing of this architecture itself. The intention of all of this is to become a um, single source of truth in the country for um, identification for these four layers that I spoke of, four entities that I spoke of. And the idea is that these building blocks can actually be leveraged then to build on top of use cases that are going to be beneficial for different ecosystem, uh, different um, stakeholders in the ecosystem. This is just the identity layer and there's a lot more that's already built on top of it by the National Health Authority. Uh, there is there are gateways that are built that are specifically focused on allowing interoperability of health services, allowing interoperability of health data, and even standardizing the claims process between a facility and a, pro- and a payer. So this essentially, in a nutshell, is kind of comprised of the stack that we speak of. And now we're seeing the market uh, participants come in, integrate their systems, and then actually build on top of these building blocks and design more use cases that are going to be relevant. And so you rightly mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of tech that goes beyond, behind the scenes, right? But uh, how does this look like for a user? So, and you said, of course, players, innovators are going to come and build on top of this, right? And of course, I'm sure something similar can be done with, say, or rather compared with the, how the UPI uh, ecosystem works, right? Because a lot is happening at the payments level, which you and I as users need not be aware of. Uh, but I have an app on my phone, say a phone pay or a Paytm through which I can access uh, uh, these services, right? So similarly, if you would uh, sort of draw the picture as to how this will work, how will this look like for a patient in a hospital? I think it's very similar. I do want to preface that ABDM currently is voluntary in nature. And this is both from a citizen perspective as well as a provider perspective. Whoever wants to participate can choose to opt in. And at some point, if you choose that you do not want to participate in this ecosystem, you have the choice to opt out as well. So for someone who wants to engage in this ecosystem, there is an entry level, which is to come and create something called an ABHA address for yourself. It's very similar to a UPI address that you may have. You need not remember it. You know it's on your application and then you use that to transact, 
right? Uh, which is then again linked to your bank and so on and so forth, right? A very similar construct here as well. And for a citizen to create an ABA address for themselves, it's as simple as walking into a facility that has in, that is using a, a software or a digital solution that is integrated with EBDM and can create that ABA for them, ABA address for them. The second is also through a self mode that you can download um, any personal health record application which has integrated again with EBDM and can give you that functionality. Or, or third is as simple as going to the EBDM, going to the ABBA website, creating that for yourself as well. So there are various ways um, and touch points how how a user can do this. And I also want to pref- and also want to add in that there are also cases for how it can be made available for folks who may not be as technologically savvy. So there are other mechanisms to also do this. But essentially, there's that entry point that has to be created. I think once that is done. A lot of it then is in the back end, right? The, the solution that's operating in the back end is what has to be integrated and the patient essentially just gets a, a far more nuanced and more sophisticated user experience where you're just getting a notification saying, hey, think you have a healthcare record that has been generated in facility X. Would you want to link that to your ABA address so that you can see it on your health locker or your PHR application? Right. Hey, you've gone to a facility. Do you want to scan and share your demographic details so you save out on time as you stand in the queue for a regi- so you can avoid standing in the queue for a registration process? So there are main. Hey, do you have a PHR application? You can actually today download any application and discover doctors who are operating across multiple platforms on a single application that you're using. So from a user standpoint, essentially enhancing their user experience in the application that they may currently use. Or perhaps if they're newer to the ecosystem, any PHR application they choose to download tomorrow and start using. Right. Uh, so you said it began in 2021 and I'm sure the work is progressing because uh, rather I want to know from you, what is the progress like? And in K- uh, and in ABDM itself, you know, getting all these people on board and increasing adaptability as well. So what are the challenges that you foresee? Uh, what is the timeline here? How quickly do you think uh, you know, this is going to be as popular if of like UPI, if not more. So what does that picture look like to you? I mean, look, I know there's a UPI comparison that comes up very often. And uh, ABDM may not have had its UPI moment yet, but I think it's on the way. And and look, I think even UPI, something like a UPI took many years in the works before it actually saw that um, that kind of traction. Uh, but, but that apart, uh, we are about two and a half years into the rollout. And from a two year and a half stand, two year and a half timeline standpoint, we've seen a fair bit of adoption that has happened. And uh, there's actually a dashboard that's available. Um, you know, anybody who wants to go see what the adoption metrics are, what the numbers are, who are the folks who are participating, uh, they can actually it's available to everybody. They can go check that out for themselves. Um, we've seen a lot of leading health tech players come and integrate. We've had about uh, about close to 200 um, ecosystem participants who've come and integrated their solutions with ABDM. And this is a mix of your HMIs, which is your hospital information management systems, your lab information management systems, your personal health record applications, uh, government healthcare programs as well, both at a state at a central level and other digital health solution um, entities as well. So we've seen a lot of diverse participation. So everyone's kind of coming in, registering themselves on this uh, sandbox that ABDM, that NHS is providing them with to come test these APIs, test the solutions, and then take that out to market and test it with their audience um, and roll it out to their audience. We've seen about 50 crore, I think 50 crore plus Indians today have an ABHA number, two and a half lakh uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, and this is a mix of both modern as well as traditional medicine who have a healthcare professional ID, which is an identification number for healthcare professionals. And we've also had about two and a half uh, lakh facilities also register, health facility registry, which is a ID for facilities in the country. And again, a mix of government as well as uh, private facilities. So there's a fair bit of adoption. Uh, but of course, I think a long way to go before you actually activate and really uh, the ecosystem is fully built and is thriving. Speaking of roadblocks, I think one thing very important to understand is that for any entity to come in, really value and benefit from the ecosystem, you need the solution companies to really make that first move and and get integrated. It's like in UPI, as if banks didn't agree to uh, become a part of it, I don't think we'd see the benefits that we do today. So getting that value proposition of getting these digital solutions to come and integrate 
and provide a very good user experience on the front end to the pro- to the doctors or the facilities wherever they're deployed i think that's very critical and that continues to be a place where um there's a lot uh, a lot of efforts going on i think both at the central and, and at a state level as well as in the private space as well so that i think is going to be a key a uh, lever to activate in the next couple of years to get more and more of these digital solutions companies to come see value and really integrate the solutions with EPDM and in the years that follow will just be about getting more users on board to their solutions right thanks for that uh, rias stay tuned to all things policy we'll be right back after a short commercial break So now I sort of want to take the que- uh, discussion towards the National Health Authority, which is the nodal body, uh, which is steering this whole process uh, behind ABDM, right? What is NHA in the sense like is it a regulatory body? Is it a government uh, uh, autonomous body? Does it work with the health ministry? So what is the sort of status uh, of it? Uh, mm-hmm. And who is executing this? Who is behind this? In the sense, is it a collaborative body between industry and uh, the government, uh, between you know volunteers like uh, I Spirit in the case of uh, Aadhaar was and so on. And secondly, uh, what are the functions that it has assumed? Uh, is it going to be looking after uh, the whole digital infrastructure being built by ABDM? In the sense, like, is it going to be an NPCI-like body or what? So, uh, so we maybe uh, you can come in here and tell us, you know, what is the overall structure of NHA and the functions that is going to be performing. So, NHA came as an uh, offshoot of the ministry. It's within the ministry. It comes under the Ministry of Health, but it was given charge when PMJ was uh, designed and implemented back in 2018, um, only to help. Because there was a digital component for it and there was an insurance component to it. So an agency that could just look into designing aspects of it. When ABDM got launched, they just felt it was natural that NHA, since they're already looking into the PMJ architecture, takes over the uh, design and adoption for ABDM. So currently, um, NHA operates as an entity, uh, independent entity with a CEO that's leading it. But it is affiliated to the ministry. So um, additionally, The focus for the government is not to build the entire stack, right? The focus for the government is to build only the critical components for it. So there were a lot of ecosystem players who came in to help build the blueprint for uh, ABDM. There were many, many think tanks, civil society organization representations, the private sector representations who were um, helping NHA build this architecture. And as of today, NHA is... um, building the stack, so the foundational layer that Ria mentioned about, because they're also critical elements, because these are verifiers, identifiers. So NHA currently is just facilitating, but a lot of the build over the foundational layers is left for open ecosystem to come in. Um, And that's where the role of private players becomes very, very important uh, from a solutioning point of view. But like you mentioned, there are ecosystem partners who have been associated with NHA, continue to be associated with NHA. And the whole DPI ecosystem is being built around same principles. So we had uh, the role for NHA. NHA is not a regulatory body. It is a nodal agency that's leading the efforts, bringing bringing partners in. But at some point of time, there would be some agency that would take up the regulatory um, aspect of it. Currently, NHA is looking into both. Right. And in the future, do you think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you to speculate here, do you think it will have to assume a different role? Because, uh, uh, you know, even let's look at the other example again, I'm sorry, I have to keep going back to these other similar frameworks. Uh, uh, but you had the UIAI, which was set up as an executive body, and later on, it got statutory powers and so on. Uh, do you foresee a need for that, first of all? And second, do you foresee something uh, similar happening once uh, this ecosystem is uh, up and thriving? Um, I think it will be a natural progression for uh, how the program moves. There was a role that NHA had to play considering the disaggregated nature of healthcare. And like Ria said, this is not only for modern medicine, which is a little more organized and structured. There is also the elements of traditional medicines that are being incorporated. So given that role, NHA had, of course, had to play a central role in doing the work itself, building the ecosystem. But as it becomes... A robust ecosystem. I think there would be a role for 
somebody, uh, be it, and I don't want to speculate if energy should take on the role, but there would be a need for someone to have more regulatory functions, more oversight and statutory uh, responsibilities than it has right now. So I think it is, it's in the future, but not too far would be my guess. Right. And you know, I, the, I can just come in. Uh, sure. Uh, I think given the Aadhaar example that you gave, right, UID is starting off as playing a certain role and over time as I think the scope and the mandate and the progress was made, the role kind of also evolved. Uh, let's put that in contrast with UPI, what NPCI did versus what RBI does, right? So we have two examples and both successful examples. And I think in health, and, and these are also, I think, if not uh, if not identity, but something like the financial sector is very regulated in our country uh, compared to health, especially digital health. I think digital health is a fairly uh, fragmented uh, space at this point in time. I also want to acknowledge the role the other ministries may play in this. Something like a Ministry of Electronics and IT, right? The, the digital component of digital health can may also fall under there. So I think there has to be perhaps a more inter-ministerial coordination that may have to come about or a special power that may have to be assigned to National Health Authority to eventually become a regulator. But I think having a regulator in digital health to ensure how do you create, manage, store, exchange digital data or um, digital devices, any of that, right? I think for that to be regulated. So so perhaps, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and that question is still out in the open because when we thought of the digital public infrastructure for India, I assume we had three important priorities, right? Identity, payments, and now healthcare. And for identity, we have a structure, like you said, uh, the UIAI. And for payments, you already had a RBI, which was regulating it. So NPCI could just be a body which is overseeing the infrastructure. So I don't know, maybe that's something for policymakers to think about, uh, you know, what kind of regulatory uh, body is suitable for uh, looking at healthcare. Uh, but that actually takes me to the next question, because, you know, why do we need regulation at all? Because there are risks, right? And these risks need to be managed. And uh, when we talk of digitalization of health records of individuals, the first thing which strikes is, you know, the privacy risk involved. Uh, and this can have vast consequences over a period of time for the individual's uh, life as well, because, you know, there might be certain uh, medical procedures that they have undertaken uh, that they don't want to be uh, become a public record. Uh, there can be leaks or selective leaks about certain health conditions about people, which may affect their uh, sort of uh, life prospects or reputation and so on. Uh, so they might be like, I can think of 20 other risks. Uh, but which is why I want to know what sort of thinking has gone into ABDM as far as uh, risk management and, you know, risk mitigation is concerned. Can an individual be assured of security of their health records and data? Uh, is consent and certain other privacy uh, safeguards in built into the system? And of course, not some nominal consent, but actual and real informed consent. Uh, so I want to know from you, you know, uh, what has been the thought process like and uh, would... You know, how would you reassure us? This, I think, comes especially because this is health data and it's as personal as it can be. It becomes all the more critical to ensure that privacy security is taken into consideration. And at the time when um, ABDM was being designed, that was also something that was core to um, all the decision makers and policy makers, right? So at the very core of um, the architecture is privacy by design. You want to ensure privacy is given its its importance and its structures in place, right? So, uh, ABDM has a place where uh, you have something called the consent manager, and no transaction or sharing of information in the ecosystem is possible without the person's consent. And like you said, there is a there is a whole description and there's a whole architecture to what a consent means. Uh, it's informed. It's time bound. It has a purpose and you have the right to retract it. Now, at no point of time um, that there are other considerations around consent, but from an architecture and design point of view, that was something very, very important alongside just to ensure that there are more layers to security. The architecture of ABDM is federated, which basically means wherever the data is being generated, it's stored there, right? So it's at the source of generation of the data. And in the ecosystem, Accessing data is not as possible because you're ensuring that it is 
must you have to keep a consent acknowledgement that this data was taken or shared or processed with an individual's consent so it would be even if it's shared the kind of sharing of information is possible has to be declared right at the same time nha had come up with this is way before dptp came into play but they had something called the health data management policy and that policy had specifically laid out security features and provisions for an individual to access then the dptp act came into came, came into play and so now the effort is to align obviously it applies its personal data so all of the provisions of the dptp also apply to health data so that is from a secure the, that is from a privacy point of view but from a security point of view for any integrator who's coming into the system any solution provider who's coming into the system there is a minimum criteria uh, that is enforced of them to ensure that their solution is secure um and once each solution provider uh, manages to get that validation and certification through an impaneled agency that is when you are assured that there's minimum security standards being met and when i say minimum i'm not saying they're easy that they're actually pretty well defined in that sense so because technology is also improving so you have certain components that keep getting added to it yeah you know i'm just thinking out loud here like for example if uh, i have to purchase a health insurance policy from some private player of my choice uh, can say the private player let's call them uh, hdfc for example right uh, can they ask me to share all my health records which has been shared in this particular uh, which has been stored in this particular uh, uh, abha id uh, with them for them to determine the premium or cost of the insurance policy is that a possibility is that intended is that unintended uh, is it a bug is it a feature can something like that happen uh, no it cannot i think what surbi was uh, referring to very important point right federated architecture uh, that data will only store uh, will be stored where it's generated and the only other place where you perhaps can view it is if you as a patient whose data or a user whose data it is chooses to pull that and store in your own health locker or whichever phr application you may choose to use so no that's not possible second one of the things that we spoke of earlier in the three gateways that nhs has built as part of the larger stack one of it is the health information exchange consent manager hicm that gateway is specifically to enable interoperability of health data in the ecosystem so that gateway can facilitate that exchange of information across two parties these could be two different facilities uh, if the patient chooses to share data from facility x to facility y could be between a payer as well as a facility but that can only happen with the consent of the user themselves one of the things that hicm one of the key components right as and as the name suggests it leverages one of the existing dpgs called the consent artifact and this is where a lot of existing dpgs have been used in multiple formats in the entire health stack um, and consent artifact happens to be one where whenever a consent is taken it is stored with this hicm gateway so there is record that somebody gave consent and all of these metrics that sir we spoke of earlier at what time and you know the metadata of that consent itself is stored at the gateway level so there is documentation of that consent second is again from a safety perspective and which i think is has been a great lever for driving adoption as well is that the way the way abdm has been designed is actually in already in accordance with the dpdp so whatever the the features that have been re- articulated for say a data principle a data fiduciary so on and so forth all of that is already in a line with how one is expect how one solution is expected to perform as per the abdm guidelines so we're actually telling integrators saying if you want to actually become compliant with the dpdp you should actually get your solution integrated with abdm because the design already allows for that you know just to push that example a little bit further say for example the insurer says uh, that uh, you have three options one you either you share your data and i'm going to fix the premium based on that second in case uh, you don't share it i'm going to draw an adverse inference uh, and say that okay you have to pay a higher premium because you're refusing to share the data of course it's your consent after all uh, and the third is an actual denial of service right uh, saying okay you're not sharing the data you're not on this platform so no tada bye bye you're not going to get insurance right uh, so in this sort of situation uh, what are the safe cars that are available and this is purely a uh, value neutral right i'm not saying oh insurer companies are bad they're going to do this they're going to hike up your premium i'm just saying of course it, it's also a positive incentive for people to you know share the data and get a lesser uh, premium or whatever right uh, so but given in this example are there safeguards for any person against a denial of service 
or you know differentiation in price or do you think that is completely fine and that is something which is enabled uh, by uh, this architecture there are two aspects to it i think uh, the way premiums are currently decided are almost sometime not accurate for what would help right they are very generalized in the way the premiums are being decided and it depends on what you want to disclose so sometimes i don't want to disclose my all health conditionalities and within the architecture there is an there is a mechanism in which people can have multiple abha accounts right and you can store different data in different accounts just how you do your upi so you might have one on google pay you might have one on paytm and there are different transactions being done um similarly let's say there is very personal information that i do not want to share which i think can impact my insurance premium that is something that as a as a beneficiary i can choose to not give consent to give access to it but at the same time i know that there are certain provisions in the uh, insurance scheme that can actually benefit me given i have some conditionalities right and i have a I have a data to show that my conditionality is at whatever level, or this is the kind of coverage I need. So I think what the proposition for insurance actually is that we assume, and we are predicting that the packaging of your schemes under insurance coverage actually become better with more incentive. Now, now the pervasive nature of the system might still operate, right? But your intent is to provide the most holistic package that can happen. and uh, there are provisions that if denied service you cannot deny someone services on it right so there are provisions of grieve redressal and all of that that an individual can go seek for a denial of insurance so yeah. i think that provision is in place yeah and actually thanks for the clarification but because it really is important that that goes out there as well uh, you know moving on i think i want to go back to what riya earlier spoke about you know having certain road blocks um, uh, in sort of like taking this infrastructure fully off the ground and one of the things that she mentioned was uptake by our uh, different players in the private ecosystem uh, and they are slow to move uh, for whatever reason they may be uh, but if you were to sort of pitch it to them you know what do you think are the incentives here uh, for different private players to come uh, and build on top of the infrastructure or uh, build different solution different health solutions for people in the country innovate create a startup ecosystem maybe and sort of like uh, also contribute to the overall uh, growth of the health sector so if you had to list some of them uh, what would be the opportunities for private players in this ecosystem i think the idea before i actually get to the specifics the idea with this entire um, the long term game here right is also to create a bigger and a more thriving market in the health ecosystem right now uh, there are very few players in the health tech space and even the ones who exist very few of them have a turnover uh, that you know maybe is 5 crore plus actually um and cuz we engage with a lot of them and um, it's there's not as much funding that goes in this space so getting that cost of integration and validate and and justifying that is a very important question that you're asking and it's a very big ask of them i think at this point in time to them i say right is there are multiple use cases that come out of this foundational blocks uh, that they can leverage i i like going back to the example and i think the zero the founder said that said this very recently right if aadhar hadn't come i don't know how my business would have scaled as much as it did in the last 6 uh, to 7 odd years because they made ekyc happen so quickly and got rid of the paperwork and with these other identities i think it's a very similar case so if you have an ident if you have something like an hpr which is an identification number for a doctor can you actually build use cases on top of that a digital solution company today perhaps has to go through their own ver- own verification process of the doctor they onboard each time but tomorrow if somebody has an hpr id and that is validated by the council and the government maybe i can onboard it i'll be the lot more is that brings down my cost and my time that's one of the multiple use cases that i know the market will design for in the future um with other registries as well right facility registry or even abha number and abha number for example we're seeing and this is live right we're seeing a lot of public hospitals reduce a lot of waiting time for patients right now for queue management and we're soon going to enable payments to be a lot easier for these public hospitals so leveraging these registries a lot of these improvements can happen in the patient journey in the doctor journey in the data entry operator journey so essentially in the end all contributing to better ui ux a better use cases for all the stakeholders that are important for them that's one second is when i talk about the different 
functionality is that ebdm is enabling from an interoperability standpoint right uh, we've not gotten deeper into uhi cuz we're keen to you know we're keen to chat further on it another time uh, but something like that where essentially you're going to get a lot more users onto your platform if you are able to offer more services in the sense of better discoverability to your users better pricing for your users today the only users who can um the only doctors that the users can see on your platform are the doctors that you have onboarded right tomorrow you're going to open up that market a lot more and you can actually engage, transact and engage with any other platform that exists so in that sense that market expands in itself your customer acquisition cost also reduces in that sense because then you'll be able to focus on one service and one service only which is to provide a good for example a phr application you don't have to focus on the doctor side anymore right because that heavy lifting somebody else is doing now same goes for um even in an insurance side right the idea with this national health claims exchange again it's not something we've gone deep into but trying to standardize the claims processing the idea of that is to bring down the cost of claims and what that will also eventually do is standardize the process for facilities as well which is to bring down their costs further currently they have to fill different forms for different tpas different payers that they engage with but if you've standardized that to one e claims format you're bringing down cost and resources for them as well so taking a step back i think there's a lot of activation that's going to happen at different touch points and more users are going to start engaging with uh tech to avail services to discover services to um manage their health data better um and of course for payments etc as well right and this is while we're not even getting into the future of emerging tech to come and build for them to build on top of right with ai blockchain what can they build on top of already so i think in that sense a lot more will unpack in the coming few years for them right you know one of the things that we uh, were having a conversation on all things policy in one of the previous episodes after supreme court has decided that you know there has to be price caps for all the hospital healthcare services in the country and has the union government to look into it uh, is you know one of the reasons why there's a lot of apprehension about overcharging in hospitals uh is because uh, there is no market of second opinions in the country right it's very hard to obtain a second opinion because uh, there is so much difficulty in getting your medical reports running around from one place to another and once somebody is admitted to an hospital it's also not that easily switchable right it's very hard uh, and of course it's uh, both like mentally physically financially a difficult process uh and i was i'm just wondering out loud so please correct me uh, do you think something uh, like the architecture behind abdm can also enable a market for second opinions to to come up in the country because sharing of health records has become much more easier right if there are specialized players who are willing to offer this uh, and that might in some way also lead to uh, hospitals refraining from overcharging for the services if at all they are doing it absolutely that's very much a use case that can be solved for by abdm let's look at the problem a little bit more closely um i think typically the top challenges that come up in term for getting a second concept, second opinion is one that your existing health data your existing health report um actually sits in a in facility x where you got your first opinion um and what you want to do is you want to take that data and be able to uh, transfer to a different facility and actually get that from a different doctor and get that opinion so to enable this seamless exchange of health data between facilities is what exactly what uhi uh, abdm enables from um uh, the health information exchange consent manager piece that i spoke of earlier um and what it also does is it enables that whatever data that was of course it can be trans- transferred from facility x to facility y with the with the patient's consent but also that when it's generated at the facility x in the first place it's linked back to back to the patient itself so they are able to maintain and own their health data and that health data is actually in their uh, phones their tab- tablets so whenever they do go um they're not uh, there's not too much paperwork etc that is involved they can actually take their devices and and share that data even before the consultation itself so so that's one part of it the second challenge that comes about in um second opinion is also finding discovering a verif- again a credible doctor with the right price point as well which is where something like the uhi comes in right the increasing the discoverability of doctors which doctor uh, you know meets the criteria that you're looking for um is is what are their credentials what are the price points where are they located so on and so forth so second consult second opinions both from a sharing of data of existing previous reports um ex- existing health history etc as possible 
as well as finding the right person to give you that second opinion is is also possible i also actually want to expand this answer and even talk about things like how what does it mean from a doctor's perspective if you are doing actually a follow up with the same patient so what about a second visit to the same doctor itself right and that's what we we're, we're encouraging use cases such as teleconsultation through a uhi because typically today what happens is if if the doctor has prescribed a test the the mom, the patient typically would share that over a whatsapp or is an informal chat and may actually not come back for that a uh, second visit that the doctor may have asked for so the doctor is not able to monetize that or charge the right right price for that second visit and that's why we're encouraging to leverage something as teleconsultation uh, teleconsultation through uhi so you're able to price it accordingly you're able to get the health uh, the report back or the health data that you want from the patient through the abdm framework itself and it all kind of feeds back into the patient's longitudinal health journey So so yes I think all in all these are exactly the use cases that that ABDM intends to fulfill. Right. Okay, I think this is a good note to end our conversation today because we are going to be taking up UHI in a subsequent episode uh, which will be out uh, uh, in the coming days. Uh, so thank you so much uh, Surbi uh, Ria for joining me on this chat today and taking us through this whole uh, digitalization of healthcare that is going on in the country uh, behind uh, the Ayushman Bharat digital mission. Uh, so thanks once again and I'll leave it to you for any concluding thoughts uh, or we can uh, sort of uh, head home. Thank you so much for having us. It was a pleasure, um, and we're hoping more and more folks are interested about the digital health journey that India is undertaking, and the next few years are going to be exciting ones to watch out for. Yeah, thank you so much, Shree. Thank you for having us, and uh, the the discussion was also a reflection for us in terms of how far the journey has been and where we are today. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, and uh, catch you again in the next episode. If you liked our show. Don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashila inst. or our website takshashila.org.in